What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to episode six of Guided Listening. Uh, this is our first shot at doing an open panel for Guided Listening, which I'm very excited about. And I invited two of my favorite trombonists working in the industry to join me as we talk about some questions of, regarding pedagogy that everybody has had. Um, I was flooded with so many different questions that you wanted to ask uh, all of you who have written in. So I'm going to go right ahead and just fire off questions to our wonderful panel. And I'd love to introduce, this is the first and third trombone in the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, bass trombonist Elon Morgenstern and principal trombone Brian Wendell. Uh, I'm so excited to have them both here. Uh, Brian did his schooling at the Juilliard School. Uh, Elon was a graduate of CCM and also University of Michigan. So we have some diverse perspectives here and some uh, excellent pedagogues as well as uh, performers. And so I'm just so excited. Welcome both of you. Thanks, Alex. Yes. Can't wait. Thanks to for having me. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to start by just asking each of you to just give me a two to three minute rundown of what your history looks like when you, you, know, you started playing the trombone, uh, what kept you in it, what kept you going, what motivated you, how you, your musical journey progressed to where you are now, just kind of truncated a Reader's Digest version so that we can all kind of understand where we're coming from here. Brian, maybe you should go first. Sure. Um, I started the trombone. Well, I started piano at age six uh, alongside my sister, who's a couple years older. Um, we were just taking lessons, you know, just starting to learn about the world of music, nothing serious. Um, and then later, I always knew that I wanted to play the trombone because my dad had played when he was a kid um, in Switzerland, and his dad played in like the community bands. Uh, so I knew it was a thing, and I really wanted to be connected uh, in that way. So I begged them. And I got my trombone um, uh, around this time, so Christmas time when I was in fourth grade. Uh, and then from there, it was, you know, actually, my dad was kind of my, my first teacher. So I always had someone at home listening with a, um, a constructive ear, let's say. <laughs> uh, and, you know, basically every day there would be discussion or, or comment on what I was doing. And I think that can either go two ways it can go like this or it can help you you know move forward so i i felt like that was a real um um yeah it was a real boost in my step to have my dad at home helping me out uh when i started to get serious was as i was in high school and you know started uh, succeeding in some of the all state and and regional band stuff uh when you see that you can kind of do well at something it becomes your thing uh so i was like the music kid and when I really got serious about practicing and wanting to be a professional was probably in 11th grade. So maybe a little bit later than some people. Um, but I joined the NEC prep youth orchestras with uh, Benjamin Zander. And that was a real experience. That was something really inspiring. We played Tchaikovsky six and that kind of really, um, got into my brain. And so then I was just practicing hard and wanting to do what I could do to, to get into the, the schools that I wanted to go to. Unfortunately, I got to study with, um, with the maestro Joe, uh, which was really invaluable for me. So, um, and then I, uh, came to Vancouver. That's right. It's been amazing. Uh, so I guess it's my turn now. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, um, I, I, uh, uh, seem to go through life, uh, like that proverbial, uh, like, robot toy that that people had when i was a kid where like it would go straight until it runs into something and then would kind of like back up and try going in a different direction uh and so my my trombone career uh looks like that uh as well uh so i actually started out uh playing a uh, recorder uh for a couple of years uh and then i played tuba uh and I, i'm from israel and and that's you know in the city that i grew up in that was uh the system that that they used um, uh, they wouldn't call it the ORF system because uh, it was Israel. Uh, um, but like, uh, uh, you know, we started out on recorder and uh, I was assigned a tuba uh, with the idea uh, that I would switch to trombo. And the way that came about um, was uh, that uh, I was told uh, I'll play trombone, but I'm going to start out on baritone. Uh, and then they uh, ran out of baritones, which after the fact that I found out was not true, uh, and so they uh, uh, handed me a tuba, which I, of course, decided had to be because I was chubby. Uh, and so I, I hated the thing, and I never practiced. 
um, and I just couldn't wait to stop playing the thing. <laughs> um, uh, but it was also like pretty easy for me. Uh, so I started tuba in fourth grade and it, it was never, it didn't seem like that much of a challenge, you know, to play the thing. Um, uh, and so the challenge came when I switched to trombone in uh, ninth grade, I rebelled uh, uh, and uh, started playing on this thing. And uh, uh, boy, that was not easy for me. Uh, and it still isn't. Um, uh, and uh, I basically decided uh, I was able to get into the uh, army band uh, in Israel. So there's a mandatory service of three years and I, I was able to weasel my way into the band. Uh, and I played euphonium uh, for almost my entire service. Wow. Um, but uh, they uh, handed me a, a bass trombone with the euphonium. Uh, and so of course uh, I took it as a slight uh, uh, and uh, that I wasn't a good enough tenor player. Uh, and so I decided to not play it and I play euphonium as much as possible. And the same thing happened in university. And I finally switched to bass trombone. Uh, my last year at uh, CCM uh, because, uh, and this is the dumbest reason to do anything, uh, I entered an ITA competition uh, on both tenor and bass, and like I worked really hard on my tenor tape, and I kind of borrowed the school's bass trombone and somebody's mouthpiece for the bass tape, and I got invited for the bass tape, and not the tenor tape. That's a great story. Uh, and so uh, I was just like, okay, I, I decided to stop fighting it. Um, and uh, I was employed, uh, you know, a couple of years later. Uh, but I would say um, that I, I, I had at the time a really good low register on tenor trombone, and it did not transfer whatsoever. Like I had to start over on bass. And I would also say that it took me probably about a year and a half of playing bass trombone exclusively to actually sound like a bass trombone player and not like a tenor trombone player who picked up a bass trombone. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, even though I was able to resolve a lot of mechanical issues that I had in my playing on the smaller horn, uh, which was part of the impetus of not changing. Um, uh, and so when I switched, I was able to like switch as a more kind of mature player, um, actually sounding the part uh, took me a very long time. Uh, uh, was that was not uh, natural? And maybe Brian has a better perspective on how I sound because he, you know, he's downwind from me so often. Uh, yeah. But like, uh, I can be pretty particular uh, about that, uh, and especially about the function. Um, this is not what we're talking about today, but the function of bass trombone in the orchestra, as it relates to the sounds of the instruments that it plays with, uh, which are not all in the trombone section. Um, and so uh, I'm very particular about that. And so that took me a long time to figure out how to recreate the sound in my head. Uh, how's that for a two minute version? It's great. It's great. There's so much good there for sure. Um, the, the bridge between multiple different sections, uh, you know, you have the contrabassoon in front of you and the tuba to the left. I can, mm -hmm. I can totally see that you're somewhat of a musical train conductor between different avenues. Yeah, and, and sometimes the sound needs to be woodsy and not brassy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's really, that, I feel like that's also something that younger bass trombonists don't think about as early as maybe uh, younger bassoonists or even younger tubists do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smart musician, dumb trombone player. We're all familiar with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, and that's, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, both of your, your histories are so, so varied. It's really, uh, a great testament for people to listen to, to see the success that you've both found and to the fact that, you know, there are overlying themes of determination and hard work mm -hmm. and, and maybe luck and just also mm -hmm. focus. So, you know, yeah, certainly I appreciate that, uh, that candid open uh, storytelling. I'm going to jump into some, some basic topics and we'll just go straight through these. Uh, I'm going to offer up an idea and then I'll uh, ask both of you to just kind of comment. Um, okay. So first off, mouthpiece buzzing this is something that we all hear about we all have thoughts on it i'd love to hear both of your thoughts just you know condensed ideas mouthpiece buzzing yay or nay how why maybe elon you can start this one off um so i've uh i'm pretty open <clears throat> about not being a huge buzzer mm -hmm. um i when i do buzz the mouthpiece and i find 
uh, that it's good for me, it's in those instances uh, where I buzz and play back and forth um, because I do feel like it's a very different technique uh, from uh, playing the trombone. I would say that for me, in my path, there was a period where uh, free buzzing was very helpful. Um, and I feel like that's more of a high brass than a low brass technique. Uh, and so I don't necessarily uh, recommend it, but I want to be open in that. I found that that for me, for what I needed at the time, uh, uh, was more helpful uh, for my playing than mouthpiece buzzing. Uh, and so I buzz a little bit here and there, but it's it's really not a lot. Um, I would say though, uh, you know, uh, Scott uh, Hartman uh, happens to be around uh, here in Tacoma. And so he's a person that I geek out with on a pretty regular basis. And he, his claim is the reason I don't buzz my mouthpiece very much is uh, because the mouthpiece doesn't reproduce uh, what I'm buzzing uh, effectively. So he, he claims that there's an equipment reason that leads me to not want to buzz my mouthpiece and not necessarily if there's something wrong with mouthpiece buzzing. So I feel like it's actually a more complicated yes. uh, uh, question, but like uh, I, I just share uh, my own experience is that it, it's not uh, uh, terribly helpful and I don't do a lot of it for me. Great. Mm -hmm. Brian? Um, personally, I am a pro buzzer, uh, but um, that comes with a, a couple of conditions, I would say. Uh, it works for me, and so the way that I do it, um, I have found to be useful in my practicing. And if I'm talking to students, all I would say is please have an open mind about trying it and experimenting, but ultimately, it's your decision. You know, if it feels better when you do it, great. If it doesn't, then then don't do it. So it's not a, it's not a must, but for me in my playing, I, I do enjoy it. Um, you know, I don't do it like extensively, like five minutes of buzzing or even three minutes. It's like short spurts of buzzing. Um, and what I try to focus on is having a warm and, um, a not a very active air. It's not like a pss airstream. It's like a very kind of subtle, um, approach to getting a tone, like a warmer buzz, like a more mezzo forte, mezzo piano buzz. Interesting. Um, as opposed to like a really direct airstream buzz. Um, let's see, I, I do agree that it is a separate thing from playing. So my embouchure is more closed. Uh, so my lips have more interaction when I buzz. And I, I really um, acknowledge that when I'm playing, I have to, it's not, I can't do the same thing because then it would be, it would give me a terrible tone. Uh, so it is a tool that I like to use and um, you know, I like to do glissandos and uh, just kind of connecting areas that might feel bumpy otherwise, like connecting those big partials. Um, what else? I do a little bit of free buzzing, which is an even more closed opening. So if, if I do free buzzing, I almost, I don't know. I haven't thought about how to express this so much, but I make sure they're nice and together. Uh, and that they can really connect these two lips. And then when you have the mouthpiece, there's a little bit more of an opening. And, and then um, when you play, it's even more resonant. Um, so yeah, not too loud, not too much. Um, just in, And free buzzing for me is even less than mouthpiece buzzing. It'd be free buzzing, like minimal amounts, mouth buzzing, um, 30 seconds, a minute. No, not even a minute if I'm working on something. It's just another, it's just a little tool and I'll, I'll combine it with flutter tonguing on the instrument. Like there's a whole lot of different techniques I'll use in addition to buzzing. Um, but yes, I do like it. Long answer. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's it's interesting for me. Um, I the, the, They're all different tools for very specific applications. And, you know, mm -hmm. like, for example, when I, when I buzz in the mouthpiece, it really is there to focus on transitions between partials and making sure that I'm blowing through and that the buzz is supported and intact. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I totally see where both of you are coming from, from the perspective of not being too harsh and not using it to replicate the exact feeling of the mm -hmm. feedback you might get from the horn. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's great stuff. Um, I hope that answers everybody's questions. We had a lot of mouthpiece buzzing questions. That's the end of the discussion. No yeah, more there it is. Debate yeah, about mouthpiece sure. All right, here's another quick fire question. Uh, let's talk about rest days, giving your face rest. Obviously, the embouchure is a muscle. Obviously, playing trombone is, uh, to some degree, a physical event that we have to uh, 
uh, mitigate as musically as possible, but I'd love to know your thoughts on days off, light days, how often, what is a great way to balance that? Brian, why don't you leave this one off? Yeah, um, that's a that's a really interesting question. I think a lot of young students um, aren't sure about what's right and what's wrong. So you hear so many different opinions. And of course, mine is just an opinion as well. Uh, I think it all comes down to context. Um, what are you, what is your mode? Like, what are you going for right now? And, and how are you feeling? Um, so for instance, if you are preparing hard for a recital, preparing hard for an audition, uh, and you're gearing up and there's, you know, there's maybe, so let's say it's three weeks away, uh, and you want to be ready and you feel like you have a lot to work on. Um, at the same time, you're already practicing so much, um, Certain light days can be really brilliant way to refresh your chops and you can work on things mentally. Um, yeah, so you might not want to, I mean, I might not take an entire day off in that scenario, uh, unless I was really feeling it. Like my lips were just battered and I think I need to really like sleep, get rest, refresh. Uh, so if I'm like really close to something important, I might not do a day off. I might do a light day. Um, but then again, I would be open to, to just feeling it out. If, um, you know, if you're in less of a high pressure, pressure cooker scenario, um, sure. Yeah. I, I definitely take days off. Um, you know, life matters and family matters. And, and sometimes, you know, you've had so much going on, uh, six days of the week and you just think, yeah, it's, it's good to rest, refresh and, and get my humanity on, um, and just, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't negatively impact me unless I do several days in a row. One day off, I feel totally fine. Two days, um, I'll get a little bit nervous. Three days, it's like I'll definitely notice something personally in my own lips. Uh, so I don't like to take much time off at all. And most of the time, I would say I don't. Uh, but sure, I'm not against that at all. You know, uh, I think, if, so first of all, I don't uh, feel like I need to take days off or time off, um, and so I don't. Um, but I also, like, there's, uh, uh, you need to listen to your body, I think. And so mm -hmm. there's been periods, um, I can think of one uh, audition in particular um, that uh, I ended up uh, doing well at, um, but one of my colleagues at the time, I played for them before I flew out and, and I was so battered, uh, that they, they told me after the fact that they were going to tell me not to, not to bother getting on the airplane and trying to get, you know, get the money back in the hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, it was like, so I was so swollen, uh, and I, I did so much to myself. So I think it, it boils down to, um, uh, really learning to recognize, and this takes time. Uh, that point of diminishing returns mm -hmm. and really learning to listen to your body while you're practicing. Uh, and that's hard to do. Uh, and I'm not always successful at that. Uh, I would also like to say that if you're finding yourself having this problem often, if you're regularly uh, needing to take a day off, um, then you either need to look at what you're doing or what you're playing on. Mm -hmm. So when I played uh, polkas uh, in a restaurant to get myself through undergrad and to finance this trombone thing, and those shifts were four or eight hour shifts of, of uh, playing, and there were, you know, 45 minutes on, you know, 15 minutes off, like, that's a lot of playing. And so I would need a day off after that, and there's nothing weird about it. But if I'm needing a day off and I'm playing my regular two or three hours a day, um, and I just need a day off a week, then I need to look at what I'm playing on and mm -hmm. uh, maybe adjust uh, and maybe get with somebody who's, who's really knowledgeable uh, and empathetic and able to help uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. I'm, uh, I'm a firm believer myself that uh, if, if you are noticing that you're constantly having that problem, and that you are constantly running into trouble with endurance, not playing terribly difficult stuff, it might be time to consider um, looking at equipment. Yeah. Or the way that you're playing, perhaps, perhaps your embouchure is too tense. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you're, you're really working it. Um, yeah. Let's talk about breakdown a little bit. Um, I know that uh, there's a lot of questions about how much practice is too much. 
Uh, Elon, I heard you once say that you need three hours a day to sound like a professional, which uh, you know, that's, that's probably my bottom line as well, what I look for. But um, I'd love to know what, what a good range of practice time for like maybe a high school student, a college student, a professional, and then how you break that down. Uh, why don't you leave this one off? So uh, for me, uh, I feel like I basically need to spend about a quarter to a third of my time on fundamentals and then move on. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Uh, I find that uh, if I don't challenge uh, my body with different types of music and my mind, frankly, too, uh, that my playing suffers. Uh, and so I make sure at, at the most, uh, however much time I have in a day to practice, and I'm usually pretty meticulous about planning, uh, then I spend about a quarter or a third of that. So for me, that's usually about an hour on my fundamentals. And then, um, you know, etudes, orchestra parts, solos, that that will change. I don't have a prescription for that because there's different periods euphonium, valves, whatever, like there's different periods that need to have different needs. But my fundamentals, what's really important is I have a tendency, this is my thing, uh, of, of really wanting things to be good and so I can get stuck on something. And so me just deciding that like, I'm just gonna move, ahead, move forward and do other things is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't disagree with that. Um, for me, it, uh, there's a slight variation depending on what I'm doing in that week uh, in terms of what kind of practice I'm getting. I mean, my, my warm up basically never varies. I have that consistent, you know, mini fundamental um, uh, tidbits <laughs> to get me started. So that usually takes me about 25 minutes and I, that's unwavering. I do that every day. Um, and that's a start of fundamental stuff. Now, in terms of if I have like a free day to practice, uh, I'll definitely want to hit my fundamentals um, for at least one of my sessions, which would be about 45 minutes or 50 minutes or depending on how crazy I'm getting an hour. Uh, so I'll, I'll generally focus on fundamentals for that amount of time. Uh, and these days, typically I have a small little break in the middle there too. So that can kind of um, um, help me organize myself. Like I'll spend, you know, 15 minutes on my Bordonis now uh, or I'll spend, um, uh, you know, five, 10 minutes on articulation. So, you know, to have to break it up and some days are different than others, you know, you just feel what you need to do. Um, and after that, I, I hope to get onto, um, some more musically engaging things like solo repertoire, um, or, you know, working on alto tremolo or doubling or something like that. Um, now if I'm talking to like a student that's going to prescribe, I'm trying to prescribe what I would like them to work on. Um, I would definitely say a whole variety is very important. You want to get to everything. You want to make sure that you are working on your solos and your um, musical stuff, your etudes, uh, but can't forget those fundamentals. So I think that a good like a dose of each is really important. Um, and I was about to say earlier about context. So if I'm playing in the orchestra and it's like a really big week um, and I may not have tons of time to do other practicing, it'll be focused mostly on fundamentals. That's for me, I'll spend time doing, you know, lots of nice scales or lip slurs or um, working on soft playing, um, just really basic things to help me repair in a way, uh, if it's like a really heavy week. If it's a light week of orchestra stuff and there's, you know, not too much going on, then uh, tons of freedom to practice whatever I want. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a great breakdown. So I thought I would ask a few short answer questions um, regarding uh, methodologies for practice. We'll go a little deeper into this. This is a little bit of a nuts and bolts question. I understand that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw out a book that we all know, and you tell me if you use it daily, every couple days, once a week, or once in a while. Or maybe it's just not the book for you. People are super curious. So if we're playing lip slurs, we're playing lip slurs every day, every couple days, what do we think? Every day. every day, absolutely. Every day, great. Yeah. Uh, every day. I, all right, Arbens. Every day, every few days. What do we think? The general mentality of playing Arbens stuff or material that has come from it, pretty much every day. I don't necessarily open the book anymore, but yeah. I'm I'm not a big fan. I'm Interesting. Sorry. No, that's great. Do you mind sharing why? 
I think Arbenz is great. Um, if you need to play in B flat major, F major, or E flat major for your entire career. I think it's, especially because I have the old version, so this is not a comment on, on the, the uh, newer publication. I think the disorganization, uh, I think having the, I mean, I, I'm picky about this stuff because of course I have like my own publication, right? right. But so a lot of the decision-making um, that I made uh, actually happened because of that old Arbin edition and kind of recognizing how difficult it is to use, just physically difficult and, and not covering materials and keys. Obviously we can transpose and, and there's a lot of, you know, it's a good like basic exercise book, uh, and it's a good reference book. I think I think the texts, specifically the texts about embouchure, uh, in the old version, are really interesting, but not helpful for me. Uh, but very kind of interesting from you know because that's how he played. Um, uh, but I I I don't think it's a very well constructed book, uh, although it does reference most every basic technique. That's a really great explanation. And that's a lot of things I hadn't thought of. And as you're saying them, I'm like, that's totally correct. That's absolutely true. I'm really great at playing in B flat, F and E flat. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Fascinating. Um, all right. Drones. Yes. No. Commonly, uncommonly. What are our thoughts? I, I, I mean, look, I, I, I feel weird because I'm talking, I mean, I have, uh, um, you know, commercial product that relates to that. So I, I, I don't want to like seem disingenuous when I answer, um, but I'll say that uh, in any period of my life uh, where I trombone gave me gainful employment, uh, there was some sort of pitch reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to pitch it, Elon. I'll pitch it for you. I think his book is great and you should all check out Telp. I'll just say it. It's been phenomenal for me. I've been playing out of it for about better part of a month. And uh, not only is my pitch better, but the stability of my playing at soft dynamics, way better. Huge okay. bonus. So I have no problem pitching that for you. Awesome. And I'll, 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 just, I'll just give you a sneak peek that uh, I'm, I'm finishing up probably uh, a half a dozen new exercises that I'll be adding. Uh, uh, to the edition, and so that should be out uh, uh, soon as well. Yeah, it's a great holiday gift for any of you trombonists, for sure. And I am on the drone train. I, I love me some drones. Yeah. Um, I find them uh, more useful because they train your ear uh, as opposed to training your eyes, right? So it's I find it easy to adjust my pitch to a tuner. Like, I look at it, oh, yeah, I'll shift it. Uh, but how much did that really help me? And m tuners don't teach you to play with other people, right? So a drone is uh, someone else that you're playing with, um, presumably, or a computer. Um, and well, I'll, I'll use tuners on occasion uh, just to check certain notes if I'm really not sure. But drones. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, I, I have a soapbox. All right. Uh, uh, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second uh, and agree with Brian. I think when we, export the responsibility of playing in time and in tune to like what used to be a $20 box and is now a $2 application. You know what I mean? When we don't take that personal responsibility and we just allow a machine to tell us what is in time and what is in tune, we do ourselves a disservice. I, I really, really feel like drones are way more effective at learning how to play in tune than uh, uh, tuners will ever be. And I feel the same about metronomes. Just being able to clap and count the rhythm is way more beneficial uh, than using uh, a metronome for me uh, in my practicing and my experience as a teacher. And uh, uh, I would also say that uh, closing one's eyes while doing both those activities uh, it seems to be uh, a way of highlighting the benefits of both those things. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I was I was not even going to mention tuners because I, I feel like we probably all fall in line in the same place with this, but reliably, when I am sounding the best and playing the best in tune and the best colleague to blend with and play with in a section, it is because I'm playing with cello drones. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I yeah, 
It's really that simple for me. Um, all right. Uh, this is a question that I like to ask every orchestral player that I interview. And I will preface by saying it is a little bit of a personal question. Um, oftentimes in the, in the, over the course of our adventures playing the trombone and trying to learn how to be the best artist that we can, we run into things that are difficult for us. Uh, playing wise, um, mentally, physically, regarding, you know, the audition process or the trombone process or, you know, you know, just the growth in general. I was wondering if you guys could each talk for a second about something that was really difficult for you. Maybe uh, something that was difficult to overcome or a challenge in your playing that maybe made you consider at one point, maybe this isn't for me or maybe I'm just not good enough. And talk about what kept you in the game. What kept you from hanging the cape up at the end of the day? Mm. I'll let you go first, Brian. <laughs> Um, I think that a couple of the most difficult things for me have been, uh, my legato, uh, just having really supported clean, beautiful sound, uh, musical sound, um, <coughs> without like dropping notes. Uh, and like, so my air wasn't moving my, you know, my, I just wasn't getting it quite. Uh, and on top of that, kind of like a soft legato, like sans uh, that excerpt um, was something that I was stuck on for a long time. Uh, and I don't know that it necessarily made me think I couldn't play. Well, there are definitely have been times where I was so frustrated about, for instance, that excerpt not going well, that it just, yeah, it was baffling. And um, obviously very frustrating Uh feeling that it works in the practice room and then the minute you feel intense pressure to do it ah, it just breaks down and doesn't work uh and so kind of definitely dealing with um anxiety related to performance uh was something that made me question whether or not i could do it for sure um so those kind of things interlapping uh being fearful of the actual presentation and having a weakness in that area that um uh, was, I guess, plaguing me. Um, and how, how did I overcome those things? Well, obviously lots of thought and dedication. Um, but at a certain point, um, a decision that it had to get better, it had to, it had to be fixed. It was going to get fixed uh, no matter what I had to do. Um, and I think what I decided to do with like the soft low legato kind of thing, um, is recognize that relaxation was mandatory for my performance. Relaxation in terms of not letting my uh, body tense up and my air stop flowing. Uh, so, so being, so allowing that to happen and, and saying that this is a must, I can't just say, Oh, like I should be relaxed. No, I actually have to be relaxed. It's a technical requirement, uh, in order for me to play this thing. Um, so that was part of it. And then also deciding to come at it from a point of strength, um, instead of saying, I want this excerpt to be the softest, um, most, yeah, the absolute softest thing I could possibly do coming at it from more of an angle. Well, actually, is that really required of the music? Um, like, is it really, is it supposed to be the softest thing contextually and, and all that, um, and coming at it from a place like well, I can play it here. And I'm going to practice it here. But when I perform it, I'm probably going to play it here. Right? So deciding where my comfort, approaching it and, and showing my best side to places that, uh, like, you know, a panel, right? Um, offering my best uh, abilities. And then if they want more, yeah, no problem. I'll do it. Uh, so kind of overcoming um some performance related anxieties on that and and you know it's always a work in progress it's not like i did it it's done Check. Uh, but having tools that um that make it feel comfortable um so love it that's that would great be probably my biggest one uh you know So I'm uh, of uh, uh, a very modest uh, level um, of natural ability uh, as a trombonist. Uh, and so there's a lot of mechanical uh, things in my playing I had to work on uh, over the years, but I'm going to actually agree with Brian uh, uh, for a change uh, that 
the biggest thing for me in retrospect uh, was acknowledging uh, the self-doubt um, and accepting it. Uh, and this this will sound crazy, but like accepting that you can be an employable player and still have areas of growth in your playing, still have issues. Um, and so like I, there, there were early on, there were a few auditions that I didn't even like want to go to. Like I didn't even want to leave the house. I thought I was wasting my money. And there was actually one audition that I didn't take that I was just like, I took like a $500 gig instead, you know, and which was stupid. It was so stupid, but like, it, it's what I did is cause I was insecure. And so I really want, um, well saying that on the one hand, like, I don't think there's anything magical about playing in orchestras. Like I like the stability, but I don't think it necessarily means I'm a better player um, or better. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm to get that job. You need to be good in very specific ways, you know? Um, uh, and, and it's, those jobs are hard to get and they, they do go to good players. Uh, um, you know, I'm probably an outlier in that regard, you know, you know, but like uh, the, there's a lot of ways to make a living at trombone and they're all legitimate and they're all good. Uh, but for me, uh, uh, I decided I wanted to play in orchestras and so auditions was something I had to figure out. And so realizing that I could still be uh, of modest ability uh, and still uh, perform on the trombone uh, at the required level uh, uh, was uh, a really important realization. And I agree with Brian that it's, it's as much an emotional uh, issue as it is a physical one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Can I actually um, finish, or not finish, but add on to what I was going to say before? <laughs> you, you inspired me. Before Elon uh, cut me off is what you're trying continue. to say. No, Who no. is this guy? <laughs> what? Um, for uh, another part of the, that emotional um, part of uh, auditioning and performing, Realizing that, of course, there is my, you know, my practice room self feeling, you know, good on a certain day, like, oh, yeah, feels great today. You know, I can do this uh, to another practice room day that feels terrible. But getting on stage um, and feeling like, okay, this is a different version of myself and finding that my mental um, talk to myself um, really made all the difference. It, it does matter what... Uh, you tell yourself um, and figuring out that no one's there to like cut you down. No one's there to, no one's going to doubt you as much as you'll doubt yourself. So if you give yourself the luxury of um, um, knowing that you can do it and going in with the mindset of that, this is a fun way to demonstrate some of the hard work you've done uh, yeah. and that the panel wants to find, you know, they want you to play your best. They really want to hear someone play well. They're not there saying like, I hope they miss that next note, sucker. Um, no, no <laughs> one wants that. Uh, and, and realizing that, you know, whether it's an audition, like an orchestra audition or a school audition, um, really just being able to show who you are and what you do well is, is really the point. And there's no like, there shouldn't be any cynicism going on behind the scenes of, of people not wanting you to do well. So believing, you know, I had to know that, uh, that there, that it was in my best interest to, to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so that's another part of, uh, another hurdle that I really had to think about a lot. I wonder if either of you have had this experience. I'm curious, the, the first audition, the first professional audition I ever advanced in, I remember thinking to myself when they called my number, they made a mistake. It couldn't have been me that I did. There, there's no way because I, mm -hmm. I played like crap and this was bad and this was bad. And I, I was, I was shocked. It was, it was like flooring. And it's, mm -hmm. it's so interesting how our brain will always remember things going poorly and not give ourselves credit for one thing, unless we actively cultivate that as a, as a habit. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I I'll, uh, I'll say that um, as an anecdote, uh, after the semis in Houston, uh, Steve Wenig, uh, who's now the, uh, uh, I think he's vice president of operations in the Oregon Symphony, but at the time he was personnel manager in the Houston Symphony, 
uh, he came into the room where we were all sitting and I was of course, uh, you know, a beginner and I was surrounded by, by people I very much uh, still admire um, in that semifinal round. Uh, and he came in and said, okay, the committee has decided to only advance two people to the finals. And I, I think I, I remember distinctively sh saying, distinctly saying shit out loud. Um, <laughs> but then the next thing he said was my name. You know, so obviously Phil walked away with the gig, but like, you know, it's like you never imagined that you could actually have like not, you know, completely screwed up. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, I would love to give each of you a little bit of time to talk about some of the projects going on in your musical lives. I know we're all at work with lots of stuff right now. Um, yeah, please uh, share share some of your your uh, your labors right now. Go for it. You want to, Brian, you should go first. Yours well, is I'll go first. Current. Brian has a CD coming out, and you should all listen to it. Everybody buy Brian's CD. I'm done. Now it's Elon. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I've taken uh, – so in this uh, pandemic time, we've all become music technologists or whatever, um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not that. <laughs> I've taken to writing – uh, and as an extension of that, you know, obviously, like I'm publishing, you know, things that are related to that, but uh, I've been writing, um, I've been blogging a little bit, uh, I've been writing arrangements. So I finished, um, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of almost finishing a trombone quartet uh, version uh, of a Christmas song, which is my favorite uh, uh, Christmas uh, uh, song, I guess. My Christmas song is my favorite Christmas song. Uh, um, uh, uh, which is, which is of course, because, you know, I, and uh, I say this and I mean it, I think all the best Christmas music was written by Jews. Uh, um, <laughs> and, I, and, uh, I think that it's, uh, yet another proof. Uh, and so that we're going to record that in the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, and throw it online. And I know that it's, it's not that vogue anymore to have these like online quartets, but it's really an opportunity for me to write and revisit like my, my, uh, remedial music theory, uh, and find, uh, uh, kind of that that process that I enjoy about performing, about collaborating and thinking, and the the mechanics uh, uh, of that. That's that's been uh, very fun, and of course, Telp uh, uh, has been uh, a really enjoyable undertaking, and I've been really humbled and happy to see the reception that it's got. Um, the one thing that uh, I did pick up uh, over this time has been some kind of basic video editing chops. Uh, and so that's just been fun. It's it's just been fun to like like screw around uh, with with uh, doing that stuff. Um, and uh, I would say the one last thing, uh, uh, and Brian may or may not agree with this, um, is I try not to see the world as if looking through like the throat of a mouthpiece uh, uh, too much. And so my side hustles uh, that are not trombone related um, are I, I like to cook and I like to eat. Um, and so, uh, uh, it's been, uh, I've been kind of doing projects, kind of learning new techniques, um, uh, over COVID and it's been, it's been really good, uh, for my, uh, palate, uh, not so much for my waistline, uh, but it's been, uh, enjoyable and, and important for me to stay engaged, uh, in what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Telp is an awesome, awesome new resource. So. It's so much fun. It makes play playing play. so much fun. It really does. Can, yeah. can I just say what it is? Because we keep saying telp. And, and we I probably like should tell people. For not telephone electricity. Phonograph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so basically the deal is this. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's basically uh, trombone fundamentals with backup tracks. Um, and the reason for that is uh, that when I was – in a place in my life where I really needed to be employed and trombone was the way I decided to do it. Uh, having steady uh, pitch references and a good idea of time and doing my fundamentals in a structured way where I didn't just like play a lip slur, but I actually played a lip slur in time and in tune with a great sound was, was really beneficial for me. And so I coupled that uh, need to do that, needing to do it with efficiency because I was always working you know, I, I, there was never a time where I could just like devote myself to trombone. Uh, um, and, and so like an efficiency of structure an efficiency of uh, navigation, uh, being able to y find uh, ways to like make what I have useful. Cause I didn't always have like a stereo or, uh, or, you know, I didn't own a TV for the longest time, you know? So like, 
uh, this this project, the Trombone Exercise Library project, is a resource of things that have helped me gain employment. Uh, in that it's fundamentals that I actually use with backup tracks that I actually use um, that are true to time and pitch and uh, are both available in physical copies and in my personal favorite electronic copies where there's bookmarks and everything is navigatable and the mp3s are in the document and everything is right there and takes very little time uh, or expertise in uh, using. It's so easy. It really is. The button's right at the top. You click it you play. It's that simple. It's so easy. Yep. Yeah. Good wow. Stuff. Good stuff. Lots of stuff to work on. Um, yeah. Thank you yeah. so much guys for being a part of this for sure. Wait, wait, wait. Brian needs to talk about his <laughs> yeah, CD. You're talk more. Yeah. Well, there's a I, CD. I, obviously. There, there is a CD. There is a, well, it's not going to be a compact disc, but there is an album <laughs> coming out. Um, I recorded it in July, um, with my pianist who's, um, studying in New York right now, but he's from Vancouver originally, Carter Johnson, uh, really, really great guy. Uh, so we, we put, um, we put the album down in July. There's still one track remaining to be recorded. Uh, that's more of like a family oriented one. Um, just briefly the the concept is, well, we're all used to it by now home. Um, so the, the, um, how I, what pieces are musical home for me, what I feel I resonate most with, what I've played uh, for many years and what has kind of become just intrinsic to my musical personality. And um, also music that are the basis of a lot of other music we play, like so I'm talking about Bach uh, being the basis of a lot of Western music. So kind of the home of music there. Um, and then last but not least, kind of my very personal home, which is um, a tune that I wrote uh, for my little boy who was born wow. a day before the album recording, nonetheless. That's really um, It was a crazy week that I'll never forget. So that's, um, that is almost done. Uh, and it still has to be mastered and all that, but yeah. So there's no release date, but that, that is in the works. Soon. Yeah. Wonderful. Wow. All right. Well, everybody, Thanks, thank you so much for, for hanging with us while we did this. This was a, a ton of fun for me, obviously. Uh, really great to, to connect with awesome people that also do this thing called playing the trombone. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can always message me at Trombone Guide. Uh, there will be more of these guided listenings coming out, probably more panels like this. This was a lot of fun. Um, and you can check out Elon and Brian uh, on Facebook. You can check them out on Instagram. Uh, you can check out Telp. I'll put a link below here. And as soon as Brian's album comes out, you will be getting links for that as well. Uh, happy practicing, everybody. And thanks for sticking with us. All right. All right. Ciao. Ciao.